Hey, our next, uh, our next speaker is Danny from Field of View. And uh, we're going to hear about uh, agricultural uh, imagery. Come on up here, Danny. Sorry. Hey everyone, um, today I'm going to give you an overview of what Field of View does and basically what we're trying to do is make UAS systems profitable for us and profitable for our users. Uh, for this we're going to talk about uh, why should we even consider unmanned aircraft uh, versus satellite or manned, uh, what kind of cameras can we use what kind of hurdles are we going to find post-processing, especially if we do the flight wrong? Uh, why direct georeferencing matters? Why sensor accuracy matters? How we can intelligently trigger our cameras? And how we can optimize for limited time? If you can fly more fields in a day, you can make more money in one day. Uh, so right now, we have a few different sources of imagery. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, but basically, on the way left, uh, we have imagery that would come from a Landsat satellite. Uh, from one of these, one pixel is equivalent to 30 meters on the ground. So if you have a field, you're going to see the average of all your crops 30 meter by 30 meter square. This imagery is available approximately every 16 days. So you don't get to see it very often. Every two weeks you get one snapshot without much resolution. The next one over, uh, five meter accuracy, comes from rapid eye satellites. They have a constellation of five satellites um, going around. They can give you imagery every six days, optimally, as long as there's not too much cloud cover. And this is generally good enough resolution for farmers. Uh, again, raises the question, why UAS when the satellite's good enough? Uh, next one over, uh, one meter resolution. This, you could come from a manned aircraft flying about 5,000 feet, AGL. And we're looking at 35 centimeters to one meter for each pixel on the ground. Finally, we get to UAS. Uh, we're talking about something that could be hand-launched or from a grass runway. This is on-demand imagery. Uh, flying 400 to 800 feet, and we can give you five centimeter accuracy. So that's each plant in your field. Uh, so what kind of cameras would you fly on these UAS? First option is uh, just a color camera. So a DSLR or a multi-lens, uh, mirrorless interchangeable lens camera. Uh, people like these because it's red, green, and blue, which is what we're used to seeing. And uh, farmers can use this aerial perspective to see uh, dead spots in the field. They can track their cows. We can monitor flood waters. Uh, just your generic imagery that people would tend to look at. Next, we get into more of the, the measurement systems, multi-spectral cameras. Uh, two options that uh, we prefer are the uh, converted cameras. So this is your, your generic color camera. Could be like a Nikon or something. They've taken off the infrared blocking filter and replaced it with a red blocking filter. So now the camera is measuring near infrared, green, and blue light. And I'll, I'll go into a, a moment why that's important. Uh, the other option is a purpose-built multispectral camera. This has the advantage of measuring near infrared, red, and green color bands, which is very important for uh, creating NDVI imagery, which is going to show you uh, normalized crop health, essentially. So we have these cameras, and we've flown them, and we've taken some pictures, and we've landed. What are we going to do with those images? Uh, in order to compete with satellite imagery, we need to take a bunch of images of smaller sections of the field and stitch them together into a mosaic. This doesn't always work right. Uh, as you can see, sort of make out on the uh, right there, if you fly a field and you're kind of zigzagging around a bit, you're going to have big gaps in your coverage and you're not going to be able to sell your data, you're not going to be able to help the customer, and you're probably not going to get called back ever. 
So what we need to do is we need to verify that we've actually covered our area of, in of interest and we have sufficient overlap in the images. This is where uh, a UAS is, is maybe better than a manned pilot uh, due to its ability to do sensor positioning more accurately. Uh, as you can see, once you've picked out the field that you're going to fly, uh, you create some sort of lawnmower pattern back and forth across the field, uh, making sure that you're overlapping your runs and you're taking enough photos uh, during flight to have good coverage of the field. This doesn't always work uh, quite right. Uh, things that can happen in the flight, you can be pushed off track by the wind. Uh, if you're dealing with a small aircraft with a side wind, uh, it may be impossible for that aircraft to actually track the GPS waypoints you programmed. Uh, you may have a crappy autopilot. So it may just not care that it's flying five meters off of its flight line. Uh, it may be flying at an incorrect altitude, which is actually a very common um, error due to like um, autopods that are only using barometric pressure to uh, figure out what their above ground level is. You might have a camera SD card fail in flight or a battery die. So you might land and think you have the greatest imagery just to find out you have none. And you usually don't find this out until you're back in the lab trying to run this through your great software that's going to spit out a perfect mosaic. So how do we solve that? Um, first, you do quality control at the field, on site. Uh, so this isn't uh, bringing a gigantic van full of computers out to the field. This is figuring out how to process your images quick uh, with low processing on a laptop. The way to do this is not through uh, the image mosaicing algorithms where they're trying to match up uh, ground control points in the imagery to connect them together like some puzzle. Uh, the easiest way to do this is called uh, direct georeferencing. So that means every image we stamp where the aircraft was, what's the pitch, what's the roll, what's the yaw. So we know where the camera was pointing precisely for every single photo. And then you can imagine using some math, you can pinpoint on the ground like where all these photos are going to be. Uh, the uh, downsides to this are that getting position and attitude data like that that's accurate is pretty expensive. Uh, you're not going to find that type of precision in even $10,000 autopilots because you don't need that precision to fly an aircraft. Uh, aircraft, if its pitch or roll is off by a few degrees, it's not going to matter too much. Um, but we do use uh, specific GPS IMU sensors that are accurate enough and are only about $3,000. Uh, so what kind of uh, sensor accuracy do you actually need? Uh, well, the, the quick answer is you only need a single frequency GPS, so that's going to give you position data around 3 meters uh, X and Y. And you need a medium grade IMU. So that's, uh, that's an IMU that's going to give you um, pitch roll data less than one degree uh, error. Uh, there, are, there are high grade IMUs that are, are much more precise, but you're looking at ten or $20,000 for those, uh, which is a lot to put up on a small aircraft and a lot to lose. So we've tried to find the the best happy medium between price and uh, use. Uh, one nice graph I have down on the lower right is showing what happens to your error in your image placement with altitude. And uh, at zero feet, you're looking at an error of three meters, because we don't know where we are x and y to three meters. And as you get higher and higher, what takes over the error is your, your pitch and roll positioning. As you can see, when the aircraft's up higher, the higher it goes, the more off you can be by just a small perturbance. So here's an example of a pretty terrible flight. Uh, you see uh, Google Maps um, satellite image and then overlaid with images taken from an aircraft with a multi-spectral camera. And this was taken using just autopilot data coming in at about five hertz, so that's five times a second. And what you can see is the images are not triggered evenly, and they're not placed well. Um, 
it's hard to make out, but, but through each of those photos, uh, there is a road and it's generally diagonal and it should be twisted a little bit and lined up perfectly with the road on the ground, but it's, it's not. So if you take imagery and you have bad positioning, you don't really have confidence in your results. Uh, you could take this back to the lab and try to mosaic and you would find that, in fact, these images don't overlap and you haven't created a proper map. So we recommend a GPS IMU accuracy with a pitch and roll of about 0.25 degrees and heading accuracy of about 0.75 degrees. And with that alone, you can create a directly georeferenced map in about five minutes uh, on the ground that looks like that. Uh, as you can see, there's, there's not perfect placement along the top. There's a, there's a road that showed as red because there's nothing growing on there. Oops. And uh, so you, you definitely want to bring it back and do your, your post-image mosaicing with some ground control points. But this is going to show you at the field, I have enough imagery of this area to move on. I've covered this whole square. So how do we do that? Our solution has been to use um, a dedicated um, processor, basically. Uh, it's hard to see black on black, but uh, go back. There is a, uh, a Tetracam multispectral camera, and we have taken a, a vector. So those, those run about uh, five grand, I'd say. And we've, we've bolted our, our GPS IMU directly to the back of this camera. So wherever this camera is pointed, we know. So it doesn't really matter if it's lined up with the X of the airframe or anything. This is its independent unit. You can tape it on and it could shift around. It wouldn't matter. We'd have accurate data. And then field of views uh, interface system is a PCB bolted in a case to the left of that. And what that's doing is it's reading in the GPS and position data from the vector nav at 50 hertz, so 50 times a second. Every 20 milliseconds, we're getting new position data. And the moment the, the camera lets us know that it's taken a photo, we associate that position with that photo name. So now we know exactly this photo was taken right here. Uh, some other interfaces that we also develop are for uh, color cameras. Again, it's hard to see up there. Uh, on the top right, we have a uh, Canon DSLR. Oops. Must be setting this down. Uh, and we've actually placed the, uh, the GPS IMU in the hot shoe of the camera. So now we, we've bolted this again to the camera so we know where the camera is facing. And we read the signal from the camera's flash to know the moment when a photo is captured so we can get uh, very closely correlated data to where the photo was taken. Uh, you can also do uh, different types of interfaces to trigger the camera. So now the system's going beyond just knowing when a photo was taken, it's telling when to take the photo. So to do this, we either use like uh, a hard wire into the camera, send an infrared signal. Lots of cameras nowadays have infrared readers. Uh, and then some of the Tetracam models also have, have serial commands uh, that you can send to capture a photo. So this intelligent triggering can actually help quite a bit with getting good data on the first flight. So on the way left, we have traditional time-based, let's take a photo every one second as we fly through. And what, what's, happening, what's happening here is uh, when the aircraft is going downwind with the wind, its airspeed is being maintained, but its ground speed is, is greatly accelerating. So we're getting no overlap between those photos. And then when the, when the aircraft is turning around and heading back into the wind, we're getting excessive overlap, so we're getting more images than we need. So how do we fix that? Well, since our system's already monitoring where we are, we can do distance-based triggering. So every time a photo is captured, we count the next five meters, we trigger another photo. So this is impervious to the airspeed. As long as your camera can keep up with the speed of your aircraft, uh, you can get proper overlap. I mean, assuming your flight lines are also overlapped enough. Um, and then just for uh, kind of icing on the cake, we decided to do limiting based on the position of the camera. If the camera is tilted way out towards the horizon, that image is garbage. It's going to be 
way too distorted to make any uh, useful mosaic out of. So what we do is we, we stop and we pause, and when the aircraft is turned too much, we don't trigger. So now you're not thinking that you have an image of an area that's going to work, and you're going to find out that it's too distorted. So kind of optimized just the best images uh, that are going to work for the final mosaic. Uh, the big picture of all of this, uh, this is kind of a cool thing showing the color, the uh, near-infrared, and the NDVI, is that there's slim margin margins in agriculture. There's slim margins everywhere. And our system is going to cost money. Uh, we need to make it justifiable to the farmer that uh, what we're doing for them is worth their time. So by making it fast and making it cheap and making it just good enough, uh, we're able to uh, show them that it's a worthwhile product. Uh, with that, uh, any questions? So uh, Danny, it's Gabe Ladd. Mm -hmm. I had uh, two questions, one more serious than the other. What are you seeing for your kind of average frame rates, you know, when you don't have the crazy people that want to fire every half a second or a quarter of a second? And then uh, when do you guys sleep? Because I get emails from the tech support at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, well, luckily our, our company works pretty late. Uh, we tend to start working about 10 a.m., so after the problems have started happening in the early morning in the field and uh, stay up till 2 a.m. answering emails and phone calls. Uh, as far as frame rates go, our system can handle frame rates at least four to five per second. Uh, the limitation right now is, is a lot with the cameras that we're using. We're not developing our own camera, so the Tetracam cameras, you're looking at about a one to two seconds per frame, so that's not even a uh, sub-second. Uh, some of our customers are using really fast DSLRs and they're triggering six to ten photos a second, and that's working just fine. Thanks. I'm uh, Tom McKinnon with Agrobotics. Um, the uh, the Agisoft Photo can Scan Pro will infer the uh, the attitude of the airplane, and it'll move the camera if necessary. Uh, but you get mo a much better mosaic if you know that ahead of time, or could you comment? On yeah, that? yeah. So. Um, Agisoft PhotoScan Pro, which is our, our recommended mosaicing software, uh, doesn't use the attitude data directly, but it will, it will use the position data to help with the mosaic. So if that's fed in, so it actually has an idea of you know, the position above ground, uh, that will help make things go a little faster with their algorithm.